I invite you this morning to take your Bible and turn to the Old Testament book of Leviticus. Leviticus. It's in the Bible. Leviticus chapter 16. I'll be beginning a 328 part series on Leviticus this morning. You know, beginning of this year, I wanted to incorporate just some doctrinal sermons. I mean, I think most of my sermons are doctrinal, but some looking at some specific things. And this was the first one I wanted to deal with. And first, I almost, I mean, I've preached on this before, but I'll, I realized this in itself, what we're going to look at today very quickly, should be a series in itself. And I understand that. So today I'm just going to hit the high spots because I want to get you to thinking about the biblical doctrine of atonement. The biblical doctrine of atonement. Jack, why would you preach on doctrine? Wow, because that's what the Bible's all about. And we American Christians are being pulled in so many different and silly ways because people don't know biblical doctrine. And I'm not talking about cults and the far out people. I'm talking about people right in the middle of the evangelical mainstream in America just believe and teach some of the most unbiblical stuff. So there's a reason for this, and um, so throughout this year, we'll be looking at some of these subjects, probably just one-off kind of sermons, but uh, I wanted to look at the atonement. It's a rich and beautiful doctrine of Scripture, and it's all through the Scripture, and I've decided to call this message today the cover-up, because that's what atonement is. It's a cover-up, and you're going to see that as we go through. And I think, if you'll stick with me, this is a kind of a tough message. If you'll listen, it was hard for me to put this message together. There's so much in it, it was hard for me to bring it all together. But I'm going to do my best to walk you through it from the Old Testament and a minute from the New Testament. Try to, try to tie up the loose ends in just a few minutes. But I think if you'll listen, you will appreciate more the salvation that you and I have in Jesus Christ. I am convinced the average church member is not appreciative enough of what Jesus has done for us. I think it shows in the way we treat the church. It shows in the greediness that we exhibit. It shows in the unforgiveness and the bitterness and the gossiping and all the stuff that we humans do I think it shows we just don't understand what Jesus accomplished for us at the cross and in his atoning work. Let me begin with this statement. No one ever gets to God or heaven without having their sin dealt with by God through his son, Jesus Christ. I want to say that again. Let me be clear. No one gets to God. You do not have a relationship with God. You do not know Jesus. Unless your personal sin has been dealt with by God through his son, Jesus Christ. You can hope for heaven, you can wish for heaven, you can think you're going to heaven, you can think you're forgiven, you can hope you're going to make it, you can hope you're good enough, but if your sins have not been dealt with by Jesus Christ, you don't know God. And that's where the atonement and other such doctrines come into place. And so we have a discussion this morning of the doctrine of the atoning work in, of Christ. We call it the atonement. And again, this ought to be a series, but I want to try to just cover it quickly today to get you to thinking about it in the days to come. And let me say this. We go to the Old Testament. We go to one of the most difficult books in the Old Testament, Leviticus, because this is where the foundation of this doctrine is, and we've got to look at it. We've got to look at it in the beginning which tells us the Old Testament is important. Don't brush off the Old Testament. Some time ago I heard a church attender 
say? She said to somebody, oh, our church doesn't preach the Old Testament. She's talking about me. And I said, what the? No, I didn't. I said, whoa, what do you mean? We don't, we don't pray. You tell us we don't have to practice the Old Testament. That, that, we don't, but that, if there's no Old Testament, we don't need a New Testament. The New Testament is irrelevant without the Old Testament. If you do not understand what happened in the Old Testament, you cannot appreciate the fullness of what you have in Jesus. So the Old Testament is important, and we preach it because we can't understand the full work of Christ without it. Everything in the Old Testament pre-shadows Jesus. It symbolizes, it points to, it is something that directs our attention to Jesus. And what we're going to see in the atonement work that the priest did in Leviticus 16, all of this, as detailed and perhaps hard to understand it is, Every single bit of it points to the work of Jesus that the video showed just a moment ago. It points to it. It prefigures it. It shadows it. The idea of atonement is mentioned 102 times in the Bible. And what I want to do, you don't have to turn to all these verses, but let me share some New Testament verses with you that regard the atonement. You can jot these down and read them in their context later. That's fine. Let me share with you, Romans 3.25 says, God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of Christ's blood to be received by us by faith. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed by us beforehand unpunished. Now, I wish I could just preach right there on the number one reason for the atonement. The number one reason for the atonement, according to Apostle Paul, is not you. I thought Jesus died for me. That's secondary. I thought Jesus loved me. I thought my picture was on his refrigerator. I thought it was I thought the gospel was all about me. I thought the church was all about me. I thought it was all no 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 you're you're secondary in the atonement. The apostle Paul says by, uh, God did this through Christ, first of all, to demonstrate his righteousness. To show who he is. To show his holiness, his perfection, his righteousness. And if you don't understand that, you don't fully get what Jesus has done for us. Hebrews 2.17. For this reason... He had made, uh, Christ was made to be like the Old Testament priest, fully human in every way, in order that he, Christ, might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Hebrews 9, 5, above the ark, there was the cherubim of glory, overshadowing the atonement cover. Now, that's kind of the picture you saw on that opening slide. That was a picture of the Ark of the Covenant. We'll get back to that in a minute. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is referencing here, the mercy seat, the lid that's set on top, the Ark of the Covenant. We'll come back to that. 1 John 2, 2, Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, not only for our sins, but the sins of the world. 1 John 4, 10, this is love, not that we loved God. God didn't save you because you love him. In fact, the Bible says we're all sinners. We've all together gone off and become unprofitable. (laughs) We didn't get saved because we love God. God doesn't keep you in his care today because you love him. It's not that we love God, John says, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for sin. So just proof enough, all through Scripture, this idea of atonement, the writer of Hebrews, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle John, finished up explaining what the Old Testament presented to us, and they concluded 
that Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, is our atoning sacrifice for sin. That if I'm to be made right with God, if I'm to be forgiven, if my slate is to be wiped clean, if I am to become to, to come out from under the wrath of God and come under the grace of God, if I'm to move from being an enemy of God to a friend of God, it's going to be accomplished solely by the atoning work of Christ. Christ does it all. All. So with that in mind, I got an old Baptist preacher on it. I got an outline, and it's all alliterated. You're going to be impressed. My seminary is showing through this morning. Now, got outlined. I'll try to make it easy for you. Just, just some things I hope you can hang a, hang a nail, you can hang something. First of all, let's look at the definition of atonement. The definition of atonement. The, the idea of atonement in Old and New Testament, it, it, it's a lot of shades of meaning. Words like covenant, sacrifice, substitution, reconciliation, pardon, forgiveness, ransom satisfaction, all those words are tethered to the idea of atonement. There's two major words, though, uh, that really help us understand atonement in Scripture, and that is the idea of what we call, I know this is kind of a big word, but just hang on, it's called expiation, expiation. And it simply means, expiation simply means to make amends, to make amends. Someone has been wronged. And you make amends with that person, that is expiation. God has been wronged by your sin and mine. He has been offended by it. He has been hurt by it. His law has been transgressed by us. And in the idea of atonement is I'm going to make amends with God. Expiate for my crimes against him. The other word is propitiation. Propitiation, that carries with it the idea of appeasement, appeasement, satisfying the demands of this God that I have insulted, satisfying his wrath against me, satisfying the law of his that condemns me. Atonement, those, those are just kind of the words that go along with it. To make amends, to satisfy the judgment against me, and, and in that, there is pardon and forgiveness, all those other things too. But if you can remember the words expiation and propitiation, to make amends, to satisfy, to, to appease. Those are the ideas in the atonement. Secondly, the demand of atonement. The demand of atonement. Now, here's the thing. Please understand this. The average Christian Ameri American, and American Christian does not get this. Atonement is absolutely necessary for you. God has one standard. One. And it's not do the best you can. It's not be the best you can be. It's not try to stay on the straight and narrow. It's not be a good person. That is not the standard of God. But we ask most people, you think you're going to heaven? Well, I think I am. Well, why do you think you're going to heaven? Well, I'm a pretty good person. Well, I th I'm sure you are. I'm, a, I'm sure you're a, a good person, but God's demand is not goodness. That's what we've missed. It's not goodness. God's demand is perfection. Perfection. You can stand before a holy God one of these days with all the church membership and baptism and good works and, and giving money and singing Jesus songs and helping ladies across the street and uh, volunteering in or service organizations, all of which are good, good thing. You can stand before God with uh, uh, the fact you worked really hard and you provided for your family. That's good, admirable. 
uh, that you were a good dad, you were a good mom, you were a good son, you were a good daughter, you never killed anybody, you paid your taxes, you never cheated on your wife, you never did anything like that. Basically, compared to a lot of other people, you're a good person. And God is going to say to you, depart from me, I don't know you. Because the standard is not goodness. The standard is perfection. Now, is anybody in their right mind this morning going to stand up here and tell us you're perfect? Jesus said, Jesus, he was very clear about that. I don't know how we miss it. Jesus was very clear in Matthew 5. He said, be holy like your Father in heaven is holy. Be perfect like your Father in heaven is perfect. That's the standard. Perfection. Being at church this morning, we're glad you're here. But being here this morning doesn't score you any points with God. Dropping a buck or two in an offering plate doesn't score you any points with God. He's looking for perfection. How you doing with that? How many have already failed on some New Year's resolutions? I've probably broken seven of the Ten Commandments since I got up this morning. The command is perfection. Therefore, there is a need for atonement. God requires something of me I cannot give him. Will you say amen right there? God requires something that we can't provide. I can't provide holiness righteousness, perfection. I can't do it. Therefore, something has to be done. I want you to get the context of this. Leviticus chapter 16. I'm not going to read this whole chapter. Okay? I'm going to read the first couple of verses. I encourage you to read it. I was encouraged this week when I said I was preaching on Leviticus. A lot of people texted me and said, what chapter? I want to read it. I'm encouraged by that. I appreciate that. and You've already read it, many of you. But for time's sake, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I am going to tell you the story, what happens in Leviticus 16. But I do want to read the first couple of verses because they pave the way for why you and I need atonement. Leviticus 16, God is speaking to the children of Israel. Specifically, he's speaking to the priest here. And he says, the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron who died when they approached the Lord. Now, I'm not going to go into that story, but a few chapters early, the priest, high priest named Aaron had two sons. And they offered what was called strange fire before God, and God killed them. That's heavy. That needs to remind you, you do not come to God with what you want to come to him with in your hand. You bring him what he demands. He demands perfection. You don't give him what you want to. You give him what he demands. And he he starts off here with a reminder. Hey, you you remember how uh, Aaron's two sons, they were named Nadab and Abihu, by the way. Remember how Nadab and Abihu uh, offered something God didn't ask for and they croaked? Yeah, keep reading. The Lord said in verse 2 to Moses, tell your brother Aaron, the high priest, that he's not to come whenever he chooses into the most holy place behind the curtain, front of the atonement cover on the ark, or he will say it out loud, die. Now, let's talk a moment. We're, we're going to get there in a minute, but just hang on. I'm going to show you a picture in a minute, but while I'm here, let me stop right here. He's talking about the tabernacle in the wilderness, in the Holy of Holies. That was a small room in the back. The only thing in there was the Ark of the Covenant. It was a box. In it was a copy of the law that had been given to Moses, and that law had been broken. There was a copy. There was a, uh, Aaron's rod that budded, that's a whole nother story. And there was some manna in there, and that's a whole nother story. But the law was in there, the law of God. And there was a lid on top of that thing called the mercy seat. 
And then there were two angels, two cherubim that were carved out in gold on top of that. And so the God says to Moses, he says, remember how those other two crackers died? Remember, they tried to give me what I didn't ask for. Just like you try to stand before God and say, God, I'm not going to give you what you ask. I'm going to give you what I want to give you. Just like some of you. They died. And God says, you, you tell Aaron, he's high priest, that he will not come to me whenever he wants to. In the Ark of the Covenant and the Holy of Holies, symbolically, it was between the wings of those two cherubim, symbolically, that God's presence dwelt. When God came to visit Israel, his presence, symbolically sort of, would be on top of the Ark of the Covenant. So he says, when the priest walks in the Holy of Holies into my presence, he will come like I tell him to come, not how he wants to come. Now, I hope you're, I hope you're already putting the dots together here. <laughs> I hope you're already getting it. You, you don't come like you want to come. You come like God says come. There is the demand for it. And he says, be perfect. So here he says, you tell him to come when I say come, how I say come. And he said, for I will appear in the cloud over the Ark of the Covenant, over the atonement cover. Verse 3, this is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. Don't barge into the presence of God. He is holy. He is righteous. He is pure. He is perfect. He cannot tolerate sin. Now, I know this is not popular preaching. I know when you go home this afternoon and turn on some of these big hair TV evangelists, they're going to tell you, they're not going to say this to you because they want your money. But I'm telling you, American church members have lost what it means to serve a holy God. Lost it. We've made him our homeboy. We've made him our best, best bud, our BFF, being Jesus. Let me tell you, before it ever gets to be you and Jesus, it is God is holy. Be like him. So he says to the high priest, he says to the high priest, you will come as I say come, when I say come. And there is a demand for it because we're all sinners. Moses was a sinner. Aaron was a sinner. And it all started with Adam and Eve. You say, well, I've kept most of the laws in the Bible. I, I try to be good. Hey, Adam and Eve were given one rule in the Garden of Eden, one. One, not 10, not 613, one, don't eat, the, don't, don't eat the fruit off that tree. Eat everything else you want. Gorge yourself. You can have anything in this garden you want, just don't do that. What did they do? They did the one thing God said don't do, and you and I are just like them. You and I are just like them. We got a gentleman in our church with whom I love talking theology, and he's told me several times, he said, Jack, I'm that guy. He said, if I see a sign that says keep off the grass, I'm going to put at least one foot on that grass just because it said don't do it. I'm not going to tell you who it was, but his initials are Mark Jones. That's the way we are. We break rules, and we don't care if they're God's rules. We break them anyway. We're going to do what we want to do. So because of that, we're all sinners. And ever since Adam and Eve, the world has groaned under the power, the presence, and the penalty of sin. Adam tried to make atonement. He tried to make atonement. When he sinned, he realized he was naked. What did he do? He covered, tried to cover his nakedness up with a fig leaf. That's called atonement. He tried to cover up. That was the first act of atonement in the Bible. It was wrong, it failed, it was miserably off track, but he realized, uh-oh, I've sinned, I'm naked, I have sinned now, i got to cover it up. And that was the first act of atonement in the Bible, covering up. 
sin. But at least Adam had a fear of God. At least when God called Adam in the cool of the day, Adam said, "Uh uh-oh, I'm in trouble. God's holy, I am not. I need to do something. That's what we've lost, ladies and gentlemen. We no longer fear a holy God. We don't. Cain and Abel, they were giving offerings. God said, here's what I want. Here's what you will bring. Cain didn't bring what God prescribed. Abel brought what he, he brought a blood sacrifice. He, he brought what God prescribed. And the Bible says God accepted Abel's offering. Because it was what God asked for to make atonement for his sin. Cain brought what Cain wanted to bring, and Cain got punished by God. Why? Another story in Scripture reminding us, you do not come to God on your terms. If you get to God, it's only on God's terms. Now, this brings up something that that, uh, theologians, I'm only deep in this. I, I know it can get, I know when bearded theologians smoking pipes sit around in libraries and discuss things. That's boring to the average person in the church pew. I get that, but I love it. But there is a, a, a theological word, term we use. It's called penal substitution. And all that means is, is that Christ was punished. He suffered the penalty. Christ was punished in a sinner's place. Penal substitutionary the substitutionary death of Christ. Christ died, but he died in my place. You got to understand that about atonement. And there is a demand for atonement because because of my sin, your sin, we are under the wrath of God. We are not the friends of God. We are the enemies of God. We are blind. We are destitute. We are Away from home, we're lost. Something has to happen that reconciles all that. And God placed our sin on Christ, shed Christ's blood instead of ours, so that I can be justly forgiven by a holy God. Penal substitution, the atoning work of Christ, satisfies. It satisfies both the love of God and the wrath of God. It satisfies them both. Atonement satisfies God's wrath against me, and it satisfies his love for me. It does both. So it is demanded. And ladies and gentlemen, there is a demand in your life to be atoned before God and mine. Any of you have done that? Some have not. Let me be clear to you, dear sir, dear ma'am, we will face God. And you will face him either under his wrath or you will face him having been delivered from it through the atoning work of Jesus Christ. The last thing you want to do is stand before God with a handful of good works you've cobbled up. That's the last thing you want to do. The last thing you want to do is stand before God and say, well, I was at church Sunday. I gave a buck or two. I was good. That's the last thing you want to do. You will stand before God either cursed under his wrath or cleansed under his blood. One way or the other. You see, right now, if you don't know Christ, if your sins have never been atoned for, if you've never accepted God's free gift of salvation, there's a warrant out for you. Paul describes it in Romans 3. For all have sinned come, sin and come short of the glory of God. There's none that, do, that does good. No, not one. We, the wages of sin is death. There's a warrant out for you. But thanks be unto God, Paul said in Ephesians, in 1 Corinthians, 
who gives us this unspeakable gift of Jesus Christ who atones for us. So there is a demand. And I want you to get that in your thinking. You owe God. I don't care who you are. I don't care how cool you are. I don't care how religious you are. I don't, I don't care how smart you think you are. You owe God. And I owe God. And if I don't know him through the atoning work of Christ, I'm under the wrath of God. And wrath will come. There is a demand. So let's quickly talk about the actual day of atonement. That's the next D. The day of atonement. God established a day of atonement for Israel in its religious and cultural life. You've heard this day. It's called Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur. Yom is a Hebrew word, means day. Kippur is the Hebrew word that means atonement. The day of atonement. Yom Kippur. They still celebrate it. Lord willing, I'll come back to that in a minute. Yom Kippur. It's supposed to happen, I think, the 10th day of the Hebrew month, Tishri, which lands, differs from year to year. It lands for us about the end of September or the first of, around the 1st of October. You've heard of Yom Kippur. You hear about it. So, guys, give me the slides now. So here in the Old Testament, they built a tabernacle to kind of, quote, house the presence of God. This is, it, this is, this is, actual, this is an actual Instagram photo of the tabernacle from 4,000 years ago. No, no. <laughs> that was funny. I don't care what you say. Uh, somebody took a picture, put it on Instagram. It looks something like this. This is close. It looks something like this. Okay? That's the, uh, the tabernacle proper. That was the view of it. And what was, what's interesting now, it's not shown here, but all the 12 tribes of Israel, three tribes set up camp on each side of it. On each side, north, south, and east, west, tribes would set up their homes. And I want to say this in case I forget it later. Every morning, the people of Israel woke up to the stench of burning flesh at the altar that I'll show you in a minute. Every morning, why? A constant reminder of their sin and the sacrifices that were having to be made to cover their sin. You need to remember that. Next one, please. This is an overview of it. There was the altar of sacrifice. That's where animals were sacrificed. Blood was spilt. And there was a fire in there where meat was burned and so forth. And again, I'm, I'm just hitting the high spots. The, the bronze basin was just a basin of water where the priest would wash his hands and so forth and so on. Then you would go into the Holy of Holies from right to left. There was a table of showbread. That was there for a reason. I don't have time to go through all this, but remember Jesus said, I am the bread of life. It goes all the way back to the table of showbread in the tabernacle, in the wilderness, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. There's a reason for that. The lampstand, there was an ornate lampstand there that they kept the candles lit all the time. Remember Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. That statement goes all the way back to the Old Testament for a reason. Then there was the altar of incense. That's where literal incense were burned. We'll come back to that in a minute. Then there was a veil. They say that the veil, it was a curtain, and it was 12 inches thick. 12 inches thick. Why? Because God's presence was behind it. You did not want to touch God's presence. It'd kill you. Then you, in the Holy of Holies, you had the ark. And I've already explained this. It was a box with one of the things was the broken law of Moses in there. On top of it was the mercy seat set on top and the cherubim. That was on top of that. Is there a cutaway view, I think, next? Yeah, something like that. I, that is not to scale, but it's something like that. That was the, the, the left part was the holy place. You see the, the curtain, and behind that was the, I'm sorry, the holy of, is the holy of holies where God's presence dwelt. Do you understand? that God had to separate himself from a sinful people. He couldn't go walk amongst the people. They were too sinful. Something had to be done. His presence was holy. 
No, no common Israelite barged into the Holy of Holies. If you did that, you would die. That was a suicide mission. Because God's holy, and his holy, righteous, perfect presence will kill you. They didn't, the average Jew didn't want to go back there. They were happy to send the preacher. Yes, send the preacher back there. He dies, not a great loss. Send the preacher. The high priest could only go in there one time a year, one day a year, only one. He could only be before the presence of God one time a year. And that was on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And legend says that he, he had to offer, a, we'll see, he had to offer a thing for his sacrifices. But if his sins weren't forgiven first, they, they tied a rope around his leg with a bell. And if he was back there ministering and his sins had not gotten forgiven properly, he would die. And they'd have to pull him back out and send in another one. My job is dangerous being a pastor, but nothing like that. Wow. Wow. But that's just kind of an overview of it. I think there's one more. Is there one of the Ark? Yeah, Ark of the Covenant looks something like that. The poles were for carrying it around when they moved. And that's where God's presence, as close as a holy God could be to sinful people, that's where his presence was. But even then, you didn't barge in there. You came only one time a year, and that with a sacrifice, an atoning sacrifice. Now, I'm sure some of you are already saying, well, why is God like that? You hear this stuff all the time. Well, why would God do that? Why would he be like that? Well, why? why, why? That, that's what you don't get. If God is God and he is, God will do what he pleases the way he wants to do it. See, we don't understand that. We question everything. Well, why did God have to have blood? Why did God have to have priests? Why did they have to go? Why couldn't God just love them and show himself to them? And actually he did in Jesus a couple of thousand years later. He did. But at this time, we ask all these silly, moronic, asinine questions about God because we don't understand who he is. God's God. And God will do what God pleases. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible that says, Who are ye, O little man, that thou would question God? Wow. You know why God did it this way? Because that's the way God wanted it done. Period. So that was the day, one day a year. Look at the duties of the priest. The duties of the priest. Real, I'm, on, I'm literally going to run. This is what you find if you started reading in, Act, in Le, Leviticus 16 and verse 3 and read all the way to the end. I'm about to share with you what you'll see if you read all the way through it without us taking time to read it this morning. First of all, the high priest, who at this time was Aaron, he was the top dog priest, the high priest. You cannot have atonement. Without a high priest. I'm going to come back to that. You can't have atonement without a high priest. So, in the first couple of verse, verse 4, he is to take off his official priestly covers, garments. He's to put on a linen robe. Now, the significance in that, the linen, the white linen, signified humility and repentance. He was in his dress saying, God, I'm, I'm approaching you both in personal and national humility and repentance. I wish I could preach there a while about how we just never humble ourselves and repent before a holy God. Amen. We just never do that because we don't think we're wrong and we don't understand how, God holy, how holy God is. Wow. Then in verse 14, and again, all this is kind of out of time. That's kind of what makes reading Leviticus hard. It's kind of spotty, and this happens, this happens over here, and you kind of have to run a timeline. So I'm going down through it as the timeline, not necessarily as it's given in the text. But he offers a bull for his own sin. It's called a sin offering. 
And that for, was for his own sin. See, that high priest was a sinner too. He wasn't some holy man with a white hat that never sinned and everything he spoke was the word of God. Not at all. He was another sinner just like the rest of us. He had to make atonement for his own sin. So he offered a bull for his own sin and for the sins of his family. And he would take with that, he would take coals from off that altar I showed you. He would take some hot coals. He would take some of the incense from the altar of incense and put it on top of the coals. And when he walked into the Holy of Holies, that would, and, and I know it's hard to imagine this, but it created a lot of smoke where he couldn't see very well. And that was to protect him so he would not get full exposure to the glory of God. It was to protect him so he would not even be able to see much of God's glory. So he would go in there on his own behalf first, and he would take the blood from the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat seven times for his own sin and seven times in front of the Ark of the Covenant for his own sin and the sins of his family. Then he would go back out, take two rams, verses 5 through 8. He would take two rams, and he would cast lots. One ram would become the sacrificial ram. The other one would become the scapegoat ram. He would take the sacrificial lamb for the sins of the people, kill it, take the blood back into the Holy of Holies, sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant, sprinkle it before the Ark of the Covenant for the sins of of the nation of Israel, all the people. <laughs> then the other ram, the scapegoat, goat, I'll get back to that in a minute. Then this would, this actually would cleanse the, the, the high priest, the altar would be cleansed, the, the tent, he would do all that with a sprinkling of blood in verses 16 through 19. Then when the, when the animals had been slain and the blood had been been he made atonement for his sins and for the sins of the other priests and his family and all the nation of Israel. And I'm really hitting the high spots here, okay? I, this deserves much better than I'm giving it, but just go with me. He would take the scapegoat and he would place his hands on it and as best he could <laughs> confess all the sins of the people of Israel. There were two and a half million of them. That's a lot of sin. Two and a half million Jews. That's a lot of sin. It'd take me years to confess all yours. My own. But he would make confession that, yes, we're sinners. We've done this. We've done that. And symbolically, that scapegoat would bear the sins of the nation of Israel, symbolically, and they would, he had some handlers, and they would lead that scapegoat out into the wilderness and turn it loose, never to be seen again. Now get this, this will make you jump for joy if so many of you didn't have Baptist backgrounds. The scapegoat symbolized sin being taken away and forgotten. And what God was trying to say to them since you have applied the blood, since you have placed the blood between me and the broken law in the Ark of the Covenant, so when I look down through the mercy seat, I no longer see the sin and the laws that you have broken. I now see the atonement blood. I take your sin, you confess it on the head of the scapegoat, and your sin is gone away, forgiven, forgotten by me for one year. Because guess what they're going to have to do next tenth of Tishri? Do this all over again. It was temporary. But they were forgiven. So he releases the scapegoats. And even the handlers who handled that coat had to come back and change clothes. It's very detailed. In verses 23 through 24, the priest bathes. He rejoices himself in his high priest attire. In verse 24, he offers another ram for him and his family and people. There's a lot of sacrifice here. And then at the end, he in verses 25 through 28, he burns the fat from the bull he sacrificed on the altar that I showed you. And he takes all what's left and remain outside the camp. They burn all that, get rid of it. And um, 
that was the Day of Atonement. Here's the two big things. Blood was placed on the mercy seat, interesting name by the way, so that God could forgive the sins of the people and they could be carried off into the wilderness and temporary salvation would be found for another year. That's the point. You know what we call that? Grace. Grace. Jack, there's no grace in the Old Testament. Every page of the Old Testament is covered with grace. You've sinned, he said. You deserve my wrath. You deserve judgment. You deserve condemnation, nation of Israel. You've broken every law I've given you. You've broken every command I've given you. You've insulted my perfection and my holiness. But I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you grace through the blood. That's grace. Now, on the Day of Atonement, there were directions given to the people. Given to the people. I want you to see this. Please see this. Who did all the work in this? The high priest. The high priest did all the work. In verses 29 and verse 30, it was for the people. But he tells them in verse 30, the people are to do no work on the Day of Atonement. To do no work. The high priest will do the work for you. Atonement will be made, and I'm quoting verse 30, atonement will be made for you. Hang on to that. Now, when you turn to Hebrews, if you've never read the book of Hebrews, we're not about shame and guilt at Watermark at all, but shame on you. You've never read the book of Hebrews. Hebrews goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It goes all the way back. And it, Hebrews explains all this stuff. <laughs> it explains it for us. If you just read it, it would be explained. Hebrews chapter 9, we come from the day of the atonement, Yom Kippur, and we come all the way to the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, chapter 9, the whole chapter. But let me start in verse 24. Verse, verse 22, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. That's why your good works are not going to get you into heaven. It's only blood that gets you into heaven. It's through the blood. Verse 23, it was necessary then for the copies of heavenly things, the symbols, the shadows, the copies, the, the tabernacle, all that stuff, the copies. They weren't the real deal, they were the copies. To be purified with these sacrifices, the ones I just mentioned, by the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. What he's saying here, you can read it. He says there's a physical tabernacle and there's a spiritual tabernacle in heaven. High priest Aaron did a temporary work down here in that physical tabernacle, but Jesus Christ, our great high and only priest, did a permanent work on our behalf in the tabernacle in heaven. That's what he's saying. Verse 24, for Christ did not enter a sanctuary made with human hands. That was only a copy of the true one. He entered into heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. On whose behalf did Jesus appear in God's presence for? You. On your behalf. On my behalf. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again. He weren't like he didn't have once he died for us, he didn't have to die again. There's no more sacrifices we're seeing. Aaron kept having to sacrifice a bull and a ram every year till he died. And then his sons had to do it, and his grandsons, and it went on and on. And when Jesus came to this earth 2,000 years after Leviticus was written, the high priest was still sacrificing rams and bulls and goats. Jesus died. And that was enough. That was enough. 
he didn't enter heaven to offer himself again. Verse 26, otherwise Christ would have to suffer many times since the creation of the world. But he has appeared once for all in the culmination of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of himself. Remember that scapegoat? Jesus is not only the sacrificial lamb that gives his blood for our sins. He is the scapegoat that carries our sin away forever and ever. There's an old gospel song I grew up out of the Red Stamps Baxter Church hymnal. Any of y'all remember that one? Yeah. It used to say, you ask me why I'm happy, I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. Well, Jack, I just, you know, I, I did something a long time ago when I was 18. I just, hey, good news. If you're in Christ, it's gone. He's forgiven you. Forgive yourself and move on. It's gone. The goat took it to the wilderness, and it's gone. Keep reading. So Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. He will appear a second time, not to bear sin again. Oh, no. But to bring salvation to those of us who are waiting on him. Okay, I got I to gotta quit. But listen. The Bible is clear. Read Hebrews. Jesus is our high priest. Hebrews 4, we have not a high priest that can be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but as all points, tempted and tested like we are yet without sin. Jesus is our high priest. We don't belong, we don't need an Aaronic priesthood, we don't need a Jewish priesthood. Jesus is our high priest. He went into the Holy of Holies one time, placed his own blood on the mercy seat one time. And the Bible says in Hebrews, he sat down and rested after that. He sat down at the right hand of God. Why? It's finished. It's over. It's done. That's atonement. That's the atoning work of Christ. People were saved by grace in the Old Testament. But it was always temporary. It was based on temporary sacrifices. You and I are saved permanently eternally because the sacrifice that saves us permanently died one time and rose again. And the directions to the people was this, atonement will be made for you. What must I do to be saved? Absolutely nothing. It is done for you. It's done for you. Jesus has done it once and for all. So I know you have questions. I know I didn't do a good job of sharing this, but there's a lot of stuff, and I just hit the high points. But I want you to leave here today understanding a bit more about the atoning work of Christ. You need it. I need it. His standard is too much for me to bear. Perfection, I can't do it. But Jesus did it. I can't manufacture enough good works to appease the wrath of God. I mean, can I just be real kind of personal here for a minute? I, So many people have this idea that, that, that little puny pee on us, little puny pee on me. I, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a speck of sand on a universal cosmos that I'm nothing. But boy, we think we're something. And we there, there, there's some of you that actually think little puny, pathetic, sinful you is going to stand before the holy, perfect creator of heaven and earth. And you're going to talk him in to letting you into heaven. Because, hey, you've been pretty good. You really think 
That's how it's going to go down. Well, he's going to have these scales there, you see. And if my good outweighs my bad, I'm, I'm going to... No, please come find that in this Bible. Please. Please, all you Bible scholars that think you know so much about the Bible, come find that here for me. And we're going to wait all day till you show it to me. No. <laughs> I mean, come find that for me. It's not in the Bible anywhere. Where did you get that? No. You will stand before God either under the condemnation of his wrath, you will stand before God under the blood of his son Jesus Christ that has made atonement for your sin, forgiven you, sacrificed for you, satisfied, appeased God's demand on you, pardoned you, forgave you, justified, made you right with God, made you a son, a daughter of the most high God. Those are your only two choices. No deals with God. No bargaining chips. You either are or you aren't. How silly, how, how silly would God be to send his son to a cross to die and shed his blood for you and then say, oh, oh you want to do it your way? Okay, go ahead, sure. That's a silly God, isn't it? To give his son and then say, oh, you want to come by your good work? Sure, sure, I'll ignore my son's work, and I'll take yours. Sure, I'll do that. No, God's not going to do that. One quick thing, and I know this is, <laughs> let me say this. And, and what I'm about to say, I don't mean arrogantly, or sarcastically at all. I just think we need to under we need to be logical. That's the problem with Christianity. Most Christians never think. Think. Based on what the Bible says about atonement, based upon what the Bible says about the day, what the blood, based on what the Bible says about Jesus being our atonement, sacrificing once and for all, for eternity, for everyone. It's done, it's over. He's never gonna do it again. Jesus paid for it all. Based on all of that. As much as I love our Jewish friends, there is absolutely no reason to celebrate Yom Kippur. None. None. Jesus fulfilled Yom Kippur. Jesus is Yom Kippur. It's done. It's over. How can you celebrate a day when you have no tabernacle, you have no altar, you have no Ark of the Covenant. You have no sacrifice. You have no scapegoat. How can you observe that day and you don't even have all the physical things to make that day happen? Does that make sense? I'm sorry. Does that make sense? You don't have a tabernacle. You don't have an altar of incense. You don't have a, you don't have a burnt altar. You don't have an ark of the God. How can you celebrate something when you don't even have the materials to celebrate it? You know why you don't have to? Because Jesus paid it all. You don't need a tabernacle. I don't need an altar of incense. I don't need a priest other than Jesus. He did it all. Now, if you're thoroughly confused, you should be right at home. But I hope, I hope those of us who know Christ today will rejoice and, and get some spiritual depth and some theology here and realize, wow, wow, I don't have to go into the holy place on your behalf. <laughs> you don't have to depend on me. Ain't that good news. You do not have to depend on Jack or any pastor to make you right with God. You, you, have, you don't have to depend on any church, any denomination, any evangelist. You don't have to depend on anybody except the great high priest, Jesus Christ, to make you right with a holy God. That's good news. Man, that's good news. I hope we Christians will learn to appreciate that. Celebrate that and sing about it and fellowship in it. That's the gospel. If you don't know Christ today, we don't twist arms. We don't bang people over the head. But if that's beginning to make sense to you, you're kind of going, oh, wow. 
You know? That would be God creating faith in you. And let him create faith. Salvation is free from beginning to end. From faith forward. He even gives you the faith to believe. So let him give you faith and accept Christ as your Savior. Let him be your atonement. The Bible says whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Will be saved. It's that simple. Father.